Welcome, everyone. We actually might have some listeners log in, but welcome, everyone, to I think our third third episode of Common Time One on One, which is an interview series from myself, Michael Skiller, that is the Education and Outreach Coordinator with Common Time Online. And our goal here is to sit down with the musicians, actors, directors, artists, painters. Uh, composers, dancers, and people connected to or tangent to the arts that are doing the good work and um, helping us advance what every human's favorite subject is, which is the arts. I would say this week, but we don't do this weekly. So this time on Common Time One-on-One, I'm sitting down with Tim Short, who was probably probably my first, if not one of the first friends that I ever had. You know, we grew up living really, really close to each other, went to the same elementary school. And after that, we all of us kind of got split up, Mm -hmm. um, going to different middle schools and whatnot. So Tim Short, thank you for coming on. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself. If you have anything to say about yourself or what you've got coming up, anything you're working on, and then after that, we'll get to these questions. Um, I'm not sure how to actually work the the app. Can I like turn my camera around so I can show what I'm working on? You cannot change the camera view. Okay. Well, I might just hit like a spin when I get to it. Sure. Um, like you said, I'm, I'm Tim Short. Uh, I'm from Columbus, Georgia, born and raised. Um, I lived there up until 2011 when I graduated from high school and then I went to Georgia State in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Stayed there till about, I graduated in 2015 with my BFA uh, with a concentration in painting and drawing. Um, Ever since then, I've been trying to like, you know, been in and out of like smaller odd jobs trying to maintain so I can pursue an art career and I applied for a residency at Mint Art Gallery. That's where I am now. And I got where? This, uh, Mint Art Gallery. The uh, Met Art Gallery in Atlanta? Uh, Mint. Mint. Like. Oh, red. like chewing gum. Yeah. I want to say the Met. Well, I <laughs> <laughs> but nah, uh, oh, at Mint and. I got it. So that's where my studio space is. This is where I'm doing all of creating at the time. What you see behind me is stuff that I made before I got here. The space, you know, some, some of the work. And then this behind me is what I'm working on now. This is like, big, big paintings. I don't know if you can capture the scale of them quite, but Especially those ones, right? Like the ones that you're working on now, like those, it's it's really clear, like just how big they are. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, it's it's a challenge you know, trying to you know just live on the day to day. You know, I'm a bit of a starving artist, so you know, just trying to make it happen and, and keep the opportunities rolling in, and you know, using what money you do you, you do cultivate into like funneling funneling it back into the art and investing in yourself consistently. So, you know, it's, it's a journey, yeah. you know, I'm not, yet, you know, but you know, I'm, I'm loving it. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm feeling blessed. I'm feeling like, you know, really, really challenged. And I just hope that good things come from that. And I know they will. So, you know, it's just trying to stay focused and disciplined. I think um, very well-known street philosopher, Two Chains, once <laughs> said is grinding plus timing. And I think that's so true, you know, like we we create our own luck. Your yeah. luck is directly correlated to the work you put in. So like you said, grinding, we see the unfinished work right now, and then <laughs> all that's missing is time. Right, right. Um, so, okay, for, for the listeners, Tim Short and I know each other. <laughs> we like I said before we grew up I guess we grew up together down the street from each yeah. other we yeah. went to the same um, elementary school and 
Some of you don't know this, but I too used to draw sometimes. <laughs> and for any of the other 90s babies out there, Tim Short and I used to draw Dragon Ball Z pictures all the time. I still remember the first time I drew a picture and you actually told me like, this is straight, like this is pretty good. It was a picture of, it was a picture of Gotenks, which <laughs> is uh, Goten and Trunks fused together. And that was one of the first times that I personally felt validated by an artist. And coming from you, that was important for me at the time because I don't know if you remember this, but it was very, it was clear very early that like, this kid is at that point, it was just drawing, at least that I saw. Now you graduated to painting, but it was pretty clear very early, like, you know, like this guy is really good at drawing. But you talked about, you talked about how hard you've been working and you mentioned your residency at this Mint Gallery. And this is actually not in the question list that I sent you, but I wrote it down yeah. as artists. As I just said, we're always looking for validation. They say oftentimes as men, we're looking for validation from men, which is why people get chains and Mercedes and this and that. But how does it feel to you to be validated in your art by this gallery? Like, does it, are you one of those where it, like it means nothing? Where like you're, you're just making art for art's sake? Was that important to you? Like, do you think it's important to an artist's career to find validation? Like, what's your take on that? I mean, it's, you know, I would say what, like, what I make is like, the, hold on. My phone, you know, is, is getting, you know, my, my phone battery is like off, so. Uh -oh. <laughs> Charger with it, so in a minute uh, you might see me like shift, but that's you know, okay. Um, I would say what you see from me as far as what I create is like an album of like everything that I like creatively. So it's like all like the movies I've watched, the, the manga I've read, the comics I've read, the you know the visual artists, you know the the, the high visual artists that I consume and stuff. All that is it's just like all these different things you know put together and like rehashed to so it's unique to me and or the hope that it's unique to me right so like as far as the validation you know you want to you want people to relate to the work you know you want people to look at the work and say yo you know this is this is dope you know i can see where you're coming from and who i feel like the work is for truly you know i would say you know, black folks, you know, people who like, like you can come from like similar situations as I do, you know, just, you know, having that, you know, that feel of like, um, I don't, I don't even know, like just a feeling of like, they understand me, you know, and, and when they look at the work, they say, wow, you know, I've been there or like, wow, you know, I know a guy like that. That is not, that's, it's not him, but I know him, you know. And like the like, one you showed with that has like the blue paisley. So, some people's not going to see that the way right. that I'm seeing right. it. Right, right, but right. I, I know what that is. Right, right. Like, you know, we, we, we grew up, I, that's the guy I grew up with. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I didn't know him personally, but I saw on social media, like people, people that I know know who that is. Right, right. So it's like. And that's like powerful to me, you know, that's like a, a dope thing. And then it's like people who don't know him, they like, I know him. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like, yeah. that makes you feel good. You know, it makes you feel like, you know, you're relating to people, you know, you're telling a story that they can vibe with. And then in telling them that story, you can get them to think about their life a little differently. You know, you can, you can like kind of talk without preaching to people. You can like, you know, get to see perspective and understand, you know, give them understanding as far as the like, you know, you know, what I can do in my life to like have that same effect on somebody. You know what I'm saying? So it's all, yeah. it's all I don't make work just to like hang it up for myself. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like, you know, if I'm gonna be real, yeah, you you absolutely want validation from your work. You know what I'm saying? So you know. Yeah, no, validation, it helps. 
I think I was at a, I've been at points in time where I was looking for that outside validation more so than my own happiness. And I think that happens a lot of times with orchestral musicians because it's like they pay me to play Beethoven's notes. They don't play me to write music. So it's like when you're playing Beethoven's music, you can only make yourself happy off of Moonlight Sonata so many times. It comes to a point where you playing Beethoven only matters if X, Y, and Z thinks that it sounds like the right Beethoven. But one of the things that I think is kind of um, maybe one of the privileges that visual artists get is that you're always living your own creation. Like for me, like I don't write music. No one's ever paid me to write music. No one's most likely going to invite me to write music anywhere. They just want to see me play other people's music. So I do think that's one of the cool things about being a creator is that, um, you know, you do get to live inside of your own art. You do get to create things, like you said, that are meaningful to you and to your audience. But I was really interested in the way that you talked about your art being an amalgamation of all the different inspirations that you have seen in your life, whether that be from comics, from the manga, from music, from movies. And as a music teacher, one of our... Um, objectives that we have is creative thinking. And like one of the lines in there is teaching the students that the world contains inspiration. So you don't have to go into large detail here, but coming from when we were younger, where we just used to draw like one to two different types of things, we was drawing this or we was drawing that. How do you go from that to this point where you can draw all these inspirations? Like what was your journey like where you were able to kind of make a scrapbook, if you will, of all these different things and then be able to actually channel that? Like how, what's, what's your pathway to being able to, re, like being able to see what you're consuming as inspiration and then be able to put out these types of like works of art like this? I mean, I would say when you know, you know, I know that I want to, you know, I want my own thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I find, I take great value in watching people do their own thing. You know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. you know, lately, I can't say that I really like it, but I, I read like One Piece the very beginning and it's like 1,000 oh, chapters on my whole chapter like 962 or something like that you know so I okay. read it all I can't say that I liked it all but it's just like you know just having getting a feel for where he was coming from when he was writing mm -hmm. it it's just you know just giving me understanding that if I was to approach storytelling like this is what I did like and that's what I don't like and it's like you trying to mm -hmm. set rules like just gaining an understanding of like what different people have in my creating and it's just like wow you know i can use that for myself you know like i'm reading yeah. or i just recently read uh nk jemison's the fifth season and this was like the wildest world building i've ever read you know in my life like this was like a novel but it read like a manga I wrote like, that this, down. Was, this was like some this was wilder than some some manga or some shit. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh. I, 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 <laughs> no, the, hey, just be you. Mostly adults will probably watch this. Okay, okay. So, so you know, so it's just like just seeing that and seeing how like she had a mastery of what the story she wanted to tell. You know, I want to have a mastery of the story I want to tell in that way. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. it's just like applying that and I, I consume so much stuff because I want to have a mastery of yeah in a way that other people have a mastery of what they have going on so that ultimately how that's how I got here like you know when we were younger stuff was good when we got older that stuff could have still been good but maybe not as much so as you build you know your taste shifts and change and you grow and you get more of an understanding of things, it's like, 
wow, you know, what if I could do that? And how would I do that? How would I do yeah. that? Or how would I, you know what I'm saying? But as for you, as far as not making music, your own music, please write your own stuff. You know, I, I would be yeah. really interested. You know, so, because I know I mean, you- I've dipped the toe in here and there, but I guess I kind of feel a little bit, because, you know, there's people who get doctorates in music composition. Yeah. And I remember my graduate school percussion professor used to always say he doesn't like playing music written by percussionists because they're they're approaching music from the from a performer's perspective and not from a composer's perspective. When I guess his mindset was that, like you said, the composer has listened to all that music has listened to all of Mozart and seen the scores and has developed that taste and then developed boundaries for what they would and wouldn't like and then leveling themselves up within their changing taste. So he kind of put this idea in my head that's like, my job is to play awesome. Your job is to compose awesome and then we will work together. But maybe, who knows, maybe one of these days, you know, when I'm not doing interviews, I might have to sit down, you know, and write something. I I mean, you hearing you say it in that way, that definitely makes sense. And visual like, art's kind of cool because you're the technician and the brains at the same time. But for me, I'm just like, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an instrument for a composer in a way yeah. you, you could I mean, say. I mean, that's that. dope. Okay. Yeah, I mean, someone has to do it. Like, the composer can't play all the instruments, you know, at the same time. That's what's up. But maybe I might have to write something. I want to ask, you talked about mastery. And when I think mastery, I think about technique. Like, in music, each instrument comes with its own set of techniques, or there's voice, clarinet, what have you. And I know also in painting, there's techniques. And usually the place that we go to master technique is school. But I feel like for visual artists especially, I feel like school can go one of two ways. Cause like anytime you see a movie about art school, there's always the scene where they're like painting fruit. But I'm thinking of if I'm Tim Short, I look at the works behind you. If that's in my head, forget apples, like there's no, t how, how do I even pretend like I care about apples? Or I'm gonna draw an apple that looks like that. And, but that's not what you're supposed to be doing. So um, Common Time is an education platform that we look to connect artists to educators, individuals and arts organizations by offering virtual sessions that look just like this where an educator like me, for example, could say, um, you know, I'm teaching visual art and my students are creating a painting where their role is the artist, they're the artist. But do they actually know any artists? You know, usually if you wanna be a lawyer, you probably know a lawyer, which is why you wanted to do that. So I myself could go on this platform, look up, Tim Short and see, oh, he's available at 1230s on Monday. And then I could schedule, book, pay you all right here on this platform that you see and have you do this with my students. So I wanna ask you about your own arts education and ask you if you think that supported the artistry that you're showing us now, or do you think it kind of held you back? Like, did you like going to art school? Could you just like not wait to be done with this? Like, what's your take on art school? Um, I would say like, you know, you like to say like somebody like Tyler, the mm -hmm. was like, you know, they're going to be and I don't need this. I didn't need this. This was a big waste of time. And right. you know, he's like, right. as like a, a genius or whatever. You know what I'm saying? I feel like the way school is like set up where you have. 
of your interest, your like direct interest. Yeah. You know, I had to take a math class. Yeah, like a you know, BFA like takes two years without biology. Like I had to take physics, I think. Right, right. And those so be, like, those are the main classes you might fail too, because like that stuff is not easy, you yeah. know. Right. Luckily for me, I had took an AP stat at Georgia State, and I didn't, or not uh, at uh, Columbus, so I didn't have to take okay. that. Coach Parker, you know, but um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but um, you know, I had to take like algebra because I chose the cheap, the easiest. You yeah. know, so we was in that. You know, stuff. I think it was like but, math you know, modeling or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, as far as art, when I started taking classes work with some that they would have us use like I would well, we had art at like Columbus High we weren't drawing with like charcoal for you know we they didn't have the money to like afford or uh, everybody had everybody having their own like new print sketchbooks or pads so you could like just practice of like you know just getting it down and stuff like that. So I feel like a lot of that, that is business because you know, building your own, you know, just getting in the habit of drawing and under, having an understanding of lighting and uh, darkness and, and, and um, you know, just having a, a scales and stuff like that, that. like basics, that it's going mm-hmm. to like take your stuff and if that's what you want, not if you're an artist or like, you know, th- that's just not what you do. So, but, but Understand of or hurt nobody. You want to paint? Is that worth it? it? But to me, so, like that was you. That was. I mean, if you look at this, you know, there's no way I would have been able to like plot these cars. Look, have, have been, you know, someone work with me to like build, build understanding about like how do, you, how do you even go about that? You know what I'm saying? Successful. And like the perspective and like, right, right. It's like yeah. people will tell you school is not important, and it might, you know, it might not be, but school was more important to me just getting my politics in order and just learning about the world. I feel like I learned more. Semester college, then K through twelve combined. You know what I'm saying? So it's like Dang. as far as like just learning about the world and like what goes on in it. You know, I feel like people dismiss that, but I mean, it's it's, I it's it depends on the person. That's so crazy you said that. Like, I feel like um, I don't know if you remember this, but in high school, I I I kid you not. I was one of those that was wearing like polos, khakis with the Sperry's every day. And I kind of thought that that's what I needed to fit in and like be successful in that environment. And this especially because I wasn't really hanging out with you and Donovan and Cody Williams like that kind of wasn't my crew anymore. So I was kind of assimilating to this other culture. And I realized when I got to Georgia State, when you look at like the homecoming king and like president of these different organizations and just Atlanta in general, it was regular black people that had that had the little curved part in their hair and did black people stuff. And that's kind of the first time that I realized, you know, I don't have to wear khakis every day for people to take me seriously once I was out of that Columbus High School bubble. Especially, and maybe that was just an Atlanta thing, not really like a Georgia State thing, but it's like in Atlanta, people that look like me and you are CEOs, are lawyers, are painters, are this and are that, and they're not necessarily changing who they are at their core 
to fit into this narrative that was like written by somebody else. So I think college was really formative for me in the same ways where, you know, especially now that I'm overseas, I kind of take pride in my accent. Nobody else in the world talks like this. You know, I kind of take pride in the fact that I might wear some Air Force Ones. Not that many other people in the world are going to even know what that is. Like now, especially being overseas, so many people look at, you know, we call it the culture. But for the viewers, I'll say our culture or Black people in America culture. So many people look at that from the outside looking in, especially internationally, that I kind of feel proud to be able to like put on some Jordans and go to the mall because people look at me wearing that the same way I might look at an Emirati person wearing the Kandora or the same way I might look at an Indian woman wearing a sari. But it's like when I was at Columbus, it wasn't looked at that way. It was looked at as like maybe being ghetto or being less than when over here it's the it's I, I see it being looked at the same way as a Sikh man wearing a turban. It's like, oh, that's his culture. That's what they wear. And like, I appreciate that. And it's like, oh, I see Michael speaks English. He might be American. He's black. I know that certain things are black culture and it's like celebrated in a way. So I think so too. I think, mm, um, maybe you won't agree with this, but I think you would have learned how to paint regardless. You would have eventually found charcoal and things regardless. Like I would have probably learned how to play drums regardless, but definitely the politics and finding out who I was was super important for me too. So that brings me to the next question. Now this question is specific. You are a painter that's gone through the full gamut of education from, you remember our elementary school art teacher, that woman? I can hear you. You remember that woman elementary school art teacher we had? Okay, there we go. Yes, I can hear you. Great. All right. All right. You were ready. So, yeah, this, um, and it could be my Wi Fi. We're talking. Here, this is what I'll have you do. Hit refresh on that link and I'll refresh mine too. And then I'll just chop this up after this. So hit that refresh.
Hey, how's it looking on your end? All right. It's looking better? You. Okay, yeah. and I hear you pretty well. Um, what I was saying is that you've had, uh, you've been through an entire lifetime worth of art education from that teacher we had at Dinah, who I remember she used to, actually I remember I wore suspenders one day and she popped my suspenders and like everybody laughed at me, but that's neither here nor there. But basically it goes to say you've had, you've been through art education from elementary school all through these professors. And this question is for our arts educators out there. How can arts educators better support their students so that more of them would choose a career path as you did, or at least become lifelong lovers of the art and just better creative thinkers in general? Just based on your experiences coming through our um, education. I would say you have to, and this is education in general, you have to be able to see the value in it by seeing, getting people to see themselves in the material that they And I guess you know, I feel like the choose I saw they understood what I was trying to do. They made me change. They tried to like just guide me like if you like that and you might like this, this and you gotta have a knowledge of like a wide array of like art. You know, and, and, and just you know, just create you know outlets to do that. You know what I'm saying? So you know, just having an understanding of, of like so being able to guide, you, like you know, that's something you know that, that requires patience on both. That requires like understanding, like understand. So we talk. And like being able to talk to people and them, you know what I'm saying? You know, or, you know what I'm saying? So I don't even say they're doing anything wrong, and you just start telling people that. <laughs> Hey, some of the kids you can't know, draw them. Can them. Yeah. You know, it's also subjective. You know, so it's just about. Say it again. Oh, I, it, I think that was, it was pretty delayed. I was just making a bad joke. Um, but I liked what you said about you were talking about just in general, just remain being encouraging if people can be late bloomers. I saw um, a post recently of this mom showing her kids art and she asked the kid like, why are you making this art? And he said, my teacher today called me an artist. So I guess I gotta, I gotta draw, I gotta make art now. And that's just something that was just so simple. Like the teacher was telling their class, like you're artists. So now this child thinks like, I'm an artist, I should probably make some art, right? Like that's what artists do. But you know, they were able to construct their own meaning and you don't have to convince that child why they're taking art now, because you're an artist. It's already been, it's been given to you. Yeah. Just getting people to buy into a program or like buy into like that they can support for themselves. That is like the challenge with like teaching and coaching and you know, especially, especially you know, how can you 
get someone to like value, like because all our ideas, track visions in your mind until it's created and make it, you know, you yeah, test it, you know. So, how do you how effective like get people to just you know, quickly engage with problems and solve those problems, you know, because it's all it is, it's like problems you have an issue out you you know a, a technique or or principle design or whatever to like put that problem or or to that problem on I like that problems and solutions we got a lot of problem. There's a lot of problem talk, but not often a lot of solutions talk. I had a coworker say that to me the other day. Like I was mad about something, and she goes, "We don't find problems; we find solutions." And in that moment, I was still pretty hot, so like I wasn't really hearing her. But she was right, though. <laughs> she was right. Um, so, okay, I want to, I want to ask you this, but I'll preface it by saying I describe your art in few words. So the only way I ask myself, like, how would I describe this art? The only real way that I could describe it is just, no, I haven't studied a lot of art, but I think that the way you paint, um, not so much the subject matter, but just like the lines to like, I don't know, the way you hold your utensil just seems so specific to you. And I personally have never seen any painting that looks like yours does on canvas. Like, I don't know if that's because of like, you hold the brush different or you, I don't really know what it is, but that's how I describe your art as so specific to you, whether it's from like the strokes or the way, just the way that you do it. I just never really seen anything like that before. And I would like to know how you describe the work that you do. Can you still hear me? I couldn't hear the last part, the last part of the question. I was asking you, yeah, how do you describe um, your art and the work that you do? I don't, I don't, I don't know what, but if yes, I can hear you, I would say, say my work is very, um, you know, it, it, say a proper execution depends on me having a, execute the vision that I have in my mind to make it believable in like a, you know, uh three dimensional space. So oh, it, it is it's like, like as far as like how spaces are constructed. Like perspective and, and, and color is used it can be very dramatic. Um, but it's very narrative is story based and very imaginative. So you know a lot of people say it's surreal. Mm -hmm. I would like to say it's then are yeah, because surreal. Uh, well, I know I haven't taken any art classes. I would. But, it, 
Yeah. Um, using like not even as a store. I like the Afrofuturistic, I think, better than because to me, your your work looks so real. It's like the one portrait. It's like, hey, we know that guy. That's not surreal. Like we know that guy. That's real, real. That was interesting to hear you talk about like surreal versus Afrofuturist. I think that term to me feels more real. Hey, can you hear me? I'm going to refresh the window, see if we can clean this up a little bit. Hey, are you connected to Wi-Fi at your studio? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, are you on Wi-Fi at your studio? Are you on Wi-Fi at the studio? Okay, I was trying to think of anything. Um, let me ask you about this. So I feel like the description of you, that you gave us was really clear. Once again, for the educators, how do we help art students find that type of individualism? Like how do we help them determine a description like yours? Because it almost feels like with the description you gave, I won't say that creating an art is easy, but when you know your, when you know what lane you're supposed to be in, driving is way easier. You know, when you know what, what you're supposed to be doing, you know? But how do we get students to start to build that kind of like, personal relationship with their art where they know like, okay, I, I do this. Um, I mean, you can go out and do their own thing, you know? So I feel like it's up to students to really you know, whatever they want to do. Um, it's like, whatever they want to do, it's like, you know, you know me personally, so you know that into fictional narratives, you know, no matter what the type, you know, be talking about like, so like, you know, books, Mm -hmm. Comic books, anything, you know, and I'm, I'm always been, I've always been like a big fan. You know, of, like, that was to like figure out that, you know what I'm saying? And me to like try to find myself in that and want myself. So, as an edge. All you can really do is just look at someone's work or work or potential that they have and hey, you don't see you. such and such and then you can show it to them take to it they take to it you know and you can say you know i don't know if the proportions are right or not. you know if you that you know it you know correct a the viewer in like seeing your vision you know what i'm saying or, or like understanding your vision, you know what I'm saying? Or like, 
you know, it can be anything like that. You know what I'm saying? So all an educator can do is just point you in a direction, a potential direction for you. You know, it's up to the student to like take themselves to like be like, yeah, you know, or like that's what I was looking for. That's what I needed. But like, yeah, as having to understand. As an educator, I get oh, like I said, an array of different artists and outlets and, and media just able to like, you know, it's really because that's all I'm putting people on, you know. I can put you on a rapper and that can set you off, you know, that can be like the spiritual guidance or, or God that you need. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That you, need, you know, I could put you on some, or some like in, anything, some some classical music or some uh, jazz, and that can be like all that you needed to to. You like I found you. What that music did for me. You know what I'm saying? And that's really all it is. We just put people on. You know how well you can put somebody on. How well you can you know, get somebody to buy, you know what I'm saying, and buy it. So, you know, that's all I could really have. Yeah. So, so what's a bad art teacher? Because you survived them all. You made it. You're still enjoying and appreciating art. I don't really look at a lot of visual art a lot. So I, would, I could say that maybe my art teachers failed me because they didn't instill a love for visual art in me. Or maybe I just wasn't a good art student. I mean, it was, everything ain't for everybody, but. but if you can, appreciation for their, their job, you know, like everybody ain't meant to be no drummer, mm -hmm. you know, or if I can That's be a drummer, true. I don't know if I can kick, kick it. I can't hold, hold a beat, but you know, I know when I'm good. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah. you know, I know it, you know, like, I appreciate it. I was never a standout individual in band. You know, when I played, you know, like, every plan, the plan wasn't no good. Didn't, yeah. you know, when I heard some, uh, who do I like? Um, So my Washington, you know, I know this is what it sounds like. You know, I know Yeah. Like you know that it's good. You know, it made me feel, you know what I'm saying? So it's like if you even a little bit, I would say you did a hell of a job for real. Yeah. I'll say too about, cause I've seen a lot of beginning band music. Um, just speaking though, your thoughts on band, you know, and maybe this, maybe this could be something I write, but I think someone should write. The problem with beginning band music is you spend the first half of your first year learning five notes, okay? But the amount of songs that are actually easy enough for you to be able to play is very limited. So you have to play like Hot Cross. You can't even play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star until like after Christmas. Like that song's actually pretty hard for a beginner. So there should be a beginning band book that has, 
I guess more interesting music in it that's also easy. Cause like you can't even play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star till probably March or February, unless you're practicing at home or maybe you're just good, you know? Um, but yeah, I guess someone's gotta do something about that. Cause I will, I will wonder how many kids do we lose out of band just because like, Hot Cross Bun is a trash song. It's not as good as the music that you hear in your regular life. So it's like how we're asking band students to survive multiple years of bad music before they're really even able to play anything that might be interesting to them. You know, so maybe someone will come up with a better, a better plan for that. Maybe me, maybe me. Um, you were able to take us for a quick walkthrough of your studio. But what I've been doing is I have been looking at some of your art on your website. And I want to show you a painting that I really like. And I, I've, I've seen it in your studio just now. And like, like I told you before, um, in, I, I'm at an international baccalaureate school. So that these schools, they teach part of their arts um, curriculum is creative thinking. So I want to show you a painting that I like and ask you if you could maybe just talk us through kind of from conception to execution, like what that creative process looked like for you. Myself personally, as a teacher, I'm always interested in hearing other people's creative process. Cause I think the hardest part about my job is teaching creative thinking. Cause like, how do you teach somebody to see something they can't see? And I have my own strategies for trying to do that, but I always feel like in the end, I'm not really doing it because how do you teach somebody to see something that's not there? You know, like how do you teach Steve Jobs to come up with the iPhone? Like he just saw something that plane was not there ever. So I'm gonna show you one that I like, and then maybe you could kind of talk us through how you thought of it, kind of how you got to the point where you actually painted it. Like what was your creative process like when you painted this? Can you hear me still? Yes. Um, for this one, this this was a pretty ambitious project at the time when I made it. I mean, I wanted to show, you know, I wanted to give the, uh, an elaborate perspective, and I wanted it to reflect an idea while doing. You know, I this is the street where you grew up or your street now? Say it again. This is the street you grew up on or your street now? Oh, it's where I grew up. It's Atterbury Drive. I see the curve. That is your street. You live right on that curve. And, um, I wanted to privilege and, and who I am in my family, as far as life. and brothers so, are, I mean, how grow with them because I was apart from them and I was like separated from them, you know because of who I was but like, like um and who I, I am but um I always felt like my brothers were and I was and because 
natural affinity for, you know, full and um, I wouldn't even say it was natural, but like I just picked it up better that within more than that. So I wanted to, to just talk about that in the painting and I wanted to how my have helped me think about introspection about my who we all were in the household growing up, how it helped me understand my own privilege and how I have to the street. I have to go to the street and get away from ideas that I was in the pain. A metaphor occurring at my behest. So my brothers are controlling like a metaphysical spiritual that is going on and they are leading me out into the of that. And that is me stepping away. Because of who I was and beginning to find myself in, in like, you know, just, just a different or, uh, you know, so ultimately that, that is what the painting was about. It's a painting of my street. I tried to invert the colors. So as these spaces that you see, these like spheres and circles that you see, you know, it's like a different dimension, and my brothers will lead me into that dimension. You know, inner spiritual into that like coming out like space spaces and like leading us into you know and ultimately, you know, my work is about being able to see yourself differently away from like. structure of likeness that and how to like afford it through those institutions and step away and go to the street or where we you know where we can thrive yeah ultimately and that's how no, no, those are both That's so crazy. Um, I know all of them. That's so man, just hearing you talk yeah. about that almost makes me feel emotional because like I didn't have I didn't have I'm an only child, I didn't have any brothers, but kind of what you're talking about to me, it sounds like respectability politics. And that's something that I had to stop in myself because it's like, okay, we went to Columbus. We went to college, and when you when you're in, and then we both were a part of programs at both of those institutions that were predominantly white. So when you start, when you have that background, you start to look at your own people as like us and them. And even my own family was like that because like my my grandmother was one of the first black teachers, you know, at Spencer and Shaw. And then, of course, like my dad was a cop and an investigator. So we kind of had this, you know, your dad was a preacher. So there's kind of like this tradition of excellence, you know. And then when I heard my own family talk about, like, let's say people on the news, for example, it kind of made me feel like there is like a me, Black people, and then a them, Black people. And I'm not them. But the older I got, I, I kind of had to get away from that and also realize my own privilege at the same time. That's crazy. And I'm, I'll be completely honest with you. I wanted to pick the photo at random so that I didn't have an opinion on it when I was listening to you talk about it. So I just kind of chose that one from your website, but I think I really needed to see that. I think I needed to see that. That's crazy. I appreciate that. Man.
what it's all about. And I actually know the street. You know everybody over there drives by your house every day. Because you know your house is on the way between Steam Mill Row and Walmart. Like between Steam Mill Road and Buena Vista Road is like your street. So I feel like your house is kind of like at the center of of the universe for those people, because like everyone's going that way. That's wild. Um, I do. The conversation is a little disjunct. And I apologize for that just because of our connection. So if, if I'm like talking over you or anything like that, I do apologize. But I wanted to ask you, um, so you told us the background of how you came up with the vision for this piece, but how do you go from that vision to this finished work? Like, did you completely flesh out that story first? And then are you on pencil and pad? Like, how do you? And also, I'm thinking of my, uh, from my educator perspective, when you came up with that vision, did you have to change or edit that vision? I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to like track your thinking process from you thought that idea, you thought of it to this is hanging on someone's wall now. Um, actually, do you mind if I call you back in line? Uh, yeah, no problem. Shoot. Greetings, everyone, and welcome back. You know, this interview for the Common Time one-on-one -on -one interview series with painter and artist um, Tim Short is was a little disjunct, and we're cut it into two parts because art happened. <laughs> and I was actually talking to our founder and CEO, and she asked me how the interview go. And I said, well, we didn't really finish it. And she said, why? And I said, I think art happened. And, she, and I was like, well, that's kind of what we're here for. So how can I have anything negative to say about that? If I'm not supporting the arts, then I shouldn't be on here talking to you. But um, mm -hmm. welcome back again. We got Tim Short here. We're just going to wrap up that interview and, yeah, tag it on to the end of the first one. So, Tim, the last time we talked, you were talking to us about building individualism, and I was kind of praising you for the fact that I think your style is so unique. And, like, I've never really seen images that, like, look quite like that or pop like that. And you kind of mm -hmm. gave some tips about helping students kind of find what their own lane is and like what their voice is. And I appreciate that. But mm -hmm. with that being said, can we take a tour like of your studio? I see a lot of stuff that you have hanging. <laughs> um, yeah, can we just like see what you're working on? Um, I have to like rotate the whole phone, right? That's fine. Whatever you gotta okay. do. Um a big painting here, but it's in Nashville now. It, it should be on from the last time. I think the last time it was like um, yeah. hanging on the wall. But um, that's you know, good. Here, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just pictures of my family. This is like old work that's just sitting in the studio, so people have like an idea of what I make. Um, can you you see that well? I can't. Yeah, it's pretty clear. Okay. And this a few more older pieces. And you know, I work pretty large, so they take up a lot of space. And you know, this is like a collection of prints, small prints that I have, and then you know, larger prints that you can have or that you to from my website. And this is what I'm working on now. So is that like pencil and then you go back back and Yeah, I start them all with like an acrylic ground. So that's you know, I get my uh surface ready by priming it with gesso and then I go over that gesso with an acrylic wash and then I just build on it with oil color. Well after I do my drawing. So this is like color pencil. Mm -hmm. And then I just do my build on it with oil. This is my 
there. So this is my underpainting. And when I get all of this layered and completed, um, I'll go over again with a final layer of color. And it'll well, that end up all the same more like piece, this one the of one with the cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a a triptych. That's, that's so it's big. like a trip a triptych series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like almost yeah. ten feet. Oh wow! So this is why they want you to to do that mural. You said you're doing a mural with Adult Swim, but you've already right, kind right, of right. shown that you are able to go large scale, like. So maybe yeah, a mirror and like even right if, up your alley. Yeah, even if I hadn't, um, they were just looking for young, you know, talent in Atlanta. Oh, mm -hmm. So, but um, there we go. But yeah, this is what I got, and um, it is very like large scale and detailed, like mural like but yeah you know i it's hard to you know really get into those smaller details with like such a large surface on like a building or something like that so you know here when you're like really up close and direct with the work you can really like you know grant life to a painting in, in a way that you know there are only small details that you you can notice by like getting up close and personal with it you know if that makes sense I'm like so. standing right in front of it. Right, right, right. It's like that's why I never understood the <laughs> Mona Lisa. Uh-huh. Because <laughs> it seemed just so basic. But I imagine mm -hmm. if you actually stood in front of it, you would yeah. probably see like, okay, like yeah. those details you're talking about. Yeah. I think it's cool. Pictures seeing of paintings too, never though. do on justice. Yeah, they have, you know, this is crazy, but in Abu Dhabi, they have something mm -hmm. called the, the Louvre Abu Dhabi. Uh -huh. And I don't know if it's like affiliated or not, but it's the uh -huh. same building and they use the name publicly, like on, not the same building, but it's like the same building. And they use <laughs> the name publicly, like on... Like, I've even seen it on an airplane magazine. So it's not like they're hiding it. So I mm -hmm. don't know if it's, like, affiliated somehow. Um, I'm assuming it must be legit or they wouldn't be putting it on the Sky Mall magazine on Delta, you know. So it must be, like, legit. Mm -hmm. But maybe, they, maybe the Mona Lisa will visit there sometime and I'll get mm. to go see some of those details. I think it's cool getting to see your studio and I'm hoping some of the educators that watch these interviews will get maybe some more insight into what their classrooms should look like. Because if you ask me, their classrooms should look like art studios. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them probably don't. Yeah. So I appreciate you taking us for a walk through there. I kind of want to talk to you about that mural so that you're going to do. So you said you're doing it with Adult Swim. And for people that don't watch TV at night <laughs> or for people mm -hmm. <laughs> that are maybe international, Adult Swim is a the nighttime version. How do you describe it? So it's... um. It's by the same people that make like CNN and Cartoon Network, but it's a nighttime mm -hmm. TV yeah. channel that shows like <clears throat> um, animated and also live things that are more for adults. Like I think because right, it comes right. on at like midnight, it doesn't have the same regulations. So you see mm -hmm. things on there that you probably wouldn't <laughs> see on Saturday right. morning, for example. Yeah. And what I think is so cool about Tim working with them is that for a long time, Adult Swim has really dug into Atlanta. They have, they sometimes have like five minute actual people and they're constantly looking like for that next thing. Do you feel mm -hmm. like, were they receptive to your ideas? Like, do you feel like they really want to like support you or is it kind of just like, industry type stuff 
Oh, no. Um, I mean, when they approached me, it seemed like pretty low to the earth. Like they had an understanding of who I was and what I had to offer. And they were pretty like receptive to it. I mean, I couldn't do everything I wanted. You know, I have to create like concepts for them that have to be approved. Yeah. But, you know, I, you know, I can't like have like the same thing that will like go on to a painting. Like it can't be like like any nudity or violence or anything because it's going to be like public yeah. art for like everyone so it's you know it's, even it's though that's fun, half though, of their know. network is like violence and <laughs> <laughs> but this is gonna be outside so. yeah 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 so i mean i'm not sure how much i should be talking about that actually i don't know like if i have their approval for to be like discussing uh, like like in depth right. what it is no you don't <laughs> have to say what it is yeah i, but, I understand um, that but um I'm excited about it. You know, Adult Swim was like foundational or, you know, it was formative for me. You know, it was like a lot of late night anime coming on there that, you know, formed how I approach, you know, art and, you know, what I want my work to do and stuff like that. So, you know, it was cool. I'm excited about it. You just, so man, that's kind of deep though. Cause now I'm thinking about watching <laughs> Adult Swim if they asked me mm -hmm. to do something like that, would be wild, right? Because we, we <laughs> were watching Adult Swim. Right, right, right. I remember watching like Veroni Kenshin, one o'clock oh, in yeah. the morning. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah, and some like of their new Cowboy stuff Bebop. is still pretty funny. <laughs> if you ever get a chance to like catch any of it or watch it online, some of the new stuff. Mm -hmm. That's cool, man. That's so exciting. That's exciting. It, it, Especially it Adult Swim is such an institution, you know. Um, and Decatur Square, that's right in like a big, that's such a big area. And that's an artsy area too. I feel like that could help mm -hmm. you as far as like sales and stuff. Because those Decatur Square people are the people that will buy, you know, your stuff. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's so, you know, great. I mean, I'm just hoping, you know, it's, it's supposed to be happening sometime in the spring. I'm not sure if I'm even supposed to be talking about it, but, you know, we'll we'll see well, what happens. Well, luckily no I'm one watches about. these. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> People definitely watch them. Please watch this. <laughs> uh, but hopefully um, no one at Adult Swim is an arts educator. I feel um, you. So not about the mural, but you, you said you're mm. going to be talking to these people. You have anything else ready for them? Like you got any comic strips? You got because this this is the time, right? You got a cartoon mm. idea? Like you got anything? I'm sure it's not. <laughs> I'm sure your cogs are working. Uh huh. I mean, I'm I'm pretty comfortable where I am as far as like what I do. But now that you say that, if I had something ready. This this absolutely would be the time, you that know. If I was like time. on pitch, you know, I said, "Man, you know, yeah. I got some, you know, black manga, you know, black anime, you know." Why not? You're on, already but, you know. in there, right? You but, talked um, about how much narrative works influenced you. I'm kind of surprised that you haven't, maybe not written a whole book, but done some <laughs> more stuff like that. You know, I mean, I or maybe have you? Maybe I haven't seen it. Um, I was writing something on my own, but it, you know, writing just takes so much time and, you know, it takes more time than even any will as far as like the breadth yeah. of how, how long it will take to complete a single project. So it's like, you definitely have to be committed and you have to want to like continue to like go into an idea and rehash it over and over again. So it's like, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure if that is for me, but I, you know, illustration and, you know, creating images is definitely for me. And I do love narrative. And so it, it's a dream to create like, yeah, uh, of my own or like a narrative of some type uh, of my own, like a graphic novel or something, but you know, baby steps, baby steps. I feel like all yeah. the paintings are kind of connected already building a system of lore and, 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 and power scale so you know yeah. we'll, we'll see what happens you know i'm not i'm not pushing anything away i like you you talked about there's being kind of like a common thread in your paintings 
And that made me think about this word universe and people use terms like the Marvel universe and this. Let me tell you what I just read. And maybe you read this too. So have you um, read about how Facebook is rebranding? <laughs> I think I, we just were talking to a guy who was trying to get us to invest with our art money. He gave like a presentation at the studio here or at the gallery space. Invest so. in what, Facebook? He he was trying to get us to invest in in anything, but he was like talking about how Facebook is going to like expand into like a a, a metaverse or something like that. that that's what I was about to talk yeah, to you about. You know, so I I mean that's that's too big brain for me. You know, I don't know anything about that. I it really Facebook sounds wild. It sounds like the uh -huh. Matrix. It, because it does. they said they want they want to come out with a crypto that you could mm -hmm. use like in the platform. And then, you know, Facebook bought Oculus, the mm. VR headset people. They were like one of the first ones that were doing the real VR. So it's, it's literally the matrix. You sit in your chair, you put on the headset and you're inside Facebook. You can make purchases because your account is linked to this crypto wallet that you've purchased Facebook coins. And you're just mm -hmm. you're you're in there. Mm -hmm. That's wild. It, it is some Ready Player One shit. I don't I don't think I want to be in there. <laughs> I, don't, I don't either. I don't either. I don't either. But I, I get it I'm, though. Um, you know, that's... It's crazy. You know Charlemagne, the radio host. Yeah. Yeah. He recently did an interview with that this guy that two guys, one wrote a book called Digital Minimalism, and the other one did that um this it was a Netflix series called like the social something. The was it the social experiment, the social it was like a five episode Netflix deep dive like into social media. And he was kind of saying that, mm -hmm. he said that the CEO of LinkedIn said publicly, all social media platforms get popular by targeting one of these seven sins. And like whether mm -hmm. it's Instagram targeting your vanity, whether it's Twitter that targets wrath, like that outrage, whether mm. it's Facebook that also in a way targets wrath. So it makes me feel like any progression. So, okay, so those sins to me are also linked to suffering in some way. And I feel like there's so mm -hmm. much suffering why would you not want to put on the headset and just go in Facebook for a lot of people? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now we're lucky because I get to play music. You get to paint, mm -hmm. but you get to make your suffering into to whatever you want really. But there's mm -hmm. some accounts in a cubicle right now who mm -hmm. would love to just go inside Facebook. And that's what's so crazy is people are going to go in there and we're mm -hmm. going to be the minority of people that's not in there. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I wouldn't want to, you I know, I like know. keeping about, I guess, analog, you know, I like keeping things in front of me, you know, I, I can yeah. only watch the screen so for so long before I'm tired, you know, I don't want to be in it, you know, I don't want to, you know, I want to, I guess remain or retain what is real to me versus what is like synthetic or like yeah you know that line is getting blurred. We're kind of yeah. going off here, but I like this. <laughs> I was so my wife Kim. Uh, so I, I so all right. My mother in law Kim's mom bought me these AirPods. Now mm -hmm. have you you have AirPods? No, I don't. There is a setting on here called transparent mode what mm -hmm. that is is you put the airpod in and you mm -hmm. hear your music but you know there's a microphone on here for talking you mm -hmm. hear the world through the microphone so that you mm -hmm. can't be like you can't not hear if you're listening to music for example you can still hear mm. 
that's crazy to me because it's like you're giving the power of your own hearing to Tim Cook and you don't know what kind of audio processing this is doing. Are you even mm -hmm. hearing? And there's people that walk around with AirPods in all day. Let's say people that work at a warehouse or people that drive Uber or this and that, and they have them mm -hmm. on transparent mode. So they're not even hearing anymore. Mm -hmm. They're hearing this microphone's version of the real world sound. Mm -hmm. This stuff is I mean, wild. I would. I, I just feel like, you know, just as an individual, I, I pride myself on being very focused. So yeah. I don't want I don't want my focus to be like so split up. Like if I'm listening to music, I want to be listening to music. Like I want to hear I wanna listen everything. To music. I don't care. Yeah. I obviously don't care what's happening over yeah. there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But if, if I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you. You know, if I'm yeah. watching TV, I'm watching TV. Like I don't want hard. You know, I don't want to be TV. so. Yeah, like multitasking to the point where it's just like I'm doing all these different things, you know, because at that point, it's like you're retaining, you know, you're retaining nothing. You're not getting the best of anything or you're not really, you know, delving into anyone's vision, you know, wholeheartedly, you know, so I just yeah. I hear you. And that's that's weird. You know, I still got the wire, you know, I'm still it's I got the old idea. iPhone. Oh, OK, <laughs> I think I have a, this is an SE. Uh huh. So it's like three or four phones back. But it's that <laughs> idea you talked about that line between like real and synthetic. And it right. made me think of this that there's people walking around right now that's list that's hearing the synthetic world. Like they're not even mm -hmm. hearing the traffic. They're hearing this version of the traffic. Mm -hmm. Like what's real? Crazy, crazy times we live in. <laughs> yeah but i'm glad yeah. to know there's still like ogs out there who like okay <laughs> so you you mentioned that word analog like i don't write a lot of original music but i do a lot of arranging of music for different purposes and mm. i still use a pencil and like staff paper because mm. mm -hmm. i don't i feel like the pipeline from my brain to knowing how to operate software, there's a gap there. Because mm. I can't, mm -hmm. I can't focus. It's like I have the music, then I've got to enter it. And that's mm -hmm. like a whole, that's like knowing how to use the software. So I, mm -hmm. I guess I'm kind of analog a little bit too. Um, okay, analog. Let me tell you, and I'll remind the viewers out there too, that Common Time is an all-inclusive platform for the arts. And we're looking to connect artists like you with educators like me and arts organizations and individuals through engaging live virtual sessions like the one that we're having. And mm -hmm. we want to empower artists by giving them a voice engage learners by giving students access to artists like you through these same sessions, and mm -hmm. also expand arts outreach by providing like digital resources to different arts organizations. One of the best parts about Common Time is the ability to bring guest artists into your classroom in settings that look like the one we're on now. So I wanted to ask you, did you meet a lot of artists growing up? Not at all. Not at all. How do you think? No, really. Would, did you want to? I didn't know that I would. I mean, I'm sure if I did, I would be like, yo, yeah. But I mean, it, it wasn't a thing. You know, I, I didn't even know that. You know, when, when I was young, people used to tell me all the time that I was going to be an artist, you know, but like, I didn't even think of that as like a viable career choice until I was doing it, you know, until I was old, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So I want to say my senior project was painting at Columbus High and I got paired with a professional artist downtown named Mark Lucas. Okay. And that might have been the first outside of like art teachers that might have been the first person who was ever a professional. You know, I get paid off commissions and teaching. This is all I do. Like. Yeah. 
Like that was the only person I knew who was on that. So moving here and actually practicing the work for myself, I got to meet a lot of professionals. But like in Columbus, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Yeah. See, we needed common time. <laughs> I think that's one of the beauties of it is, and mm -hmm. I, I've asked some educators this, and I have to ask myself this. If I'm the only musician my students know, that's a problem because no one wants to, not to be like self-deprecating or anything, but it's like, no, they don't want to be me. Like, I'm a teacher <laughs> working, I'm working with them. You know what I'm saying? Okay. There's not, there, it's hard for them to have big aspirational goals if they've never seen anybody bigger than me. I, I feel that. I definitely So I'm actually that. surprised that you didn't meet other artists because so you really were taking a leap of faith going to art school because it's not like you had a bunch of role models you were really just like i'm in it i'm just gonna do it oh i like i never i never even thought of it that way like you know i'm all, i was always so focused on what was directly in front of me like just getting doing the next project even getting paid for what was in front of me like i was just creating my own thing so so having a career building a life i was still very much a child when so when i chose that as my major it was just because i was like i was good at it and and i felt like you know i were other people who were good at it you know what i'm saying so mm -hmm. you know i wasn't even thinking about like a career and long term and 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 or investing and and building a a name for myself and, and all this got to do to survive you know i was just like not you know i was just like man i like painting what if this what if i painted that yeah. what if i painted that and then it's just like i was yeah. just making it you know what i'm saying and it's largely the same you know i'm just like networking more now and you know, I have to do things to live, you know, so it's like, you know, but I know I didn't know any, I don't think I knew any, any artist, you know, I didn't know no, no musicians growing up, you know, no, yeah, especially making the music that I would listen to. I didn't know no jazz musician, yeah, no rapper. We met P. Diddy like one that. time at the community center. <laughs> Uh, on on Steam, yeah, that early that day. He, I do remember you telling us about. Me, so. You did. You were not there. I had left early that day. Bro, P Diddy came in there. I I remember. I remember y'all telling me, and I want to say you might have had a son with him. Yeah. Well, apparently he was renting out the whole thing for like a party. And apparently they said, like, mm. as part of the contract, like, will you come say what's up to the kids just for five minutes, you know? <laughs> but I remember him being cool. Uh -huh. I'm trying to think of if I knew any musicians. I mean, I mostly took lessons with college students. So I knew them, mm. but they weren't necessarily professionals. I mean, I, cause I will, there's a youth orchestra at Columbus State. You know, I don't mm -hmm. really think I knew, okay. So my, the, the Columbus band director did used to have people come in sometimes to see us. Mm -hmm. So I guess I did know mm -hmm. them, but I guess I didn't really know that many musicians either, to be honest. And I definitely didn't know mm -hmm. like any jazz musicians or any any popular musicians that like play rap or R and B or like anything like that. I didn't know any of them. That That's right. crazy. Yeah. Nah. Um, you talked about we talked about this word universe, and you talked about there kind of being a thread in your work. So what's the Tim Short universe? Paint like give me that picture. What's the <laughs> I'm standing in the Tim Shore universe right now. Like, what's there? Uh huh. 
Um, I would say the paintings are connected by an idea that you know the, the people who are special to me. There are people who were like for the most part born and raised like me in that and and you in that you know we didn't have access to a lot of things so we just out here you know what i'm saying we just we just regular folks so you know yeah. in my universe i would say it's just like regular folks being venerated to a point where they have the like alter and control their own space and their the, the atmosphere around them you know so you know i would say my universe out of you know, wild, atmospheric, or logical, or cosmic, or or ethereal, celestial yep. events, you know, occurring in people at the center of them, and 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 people I know and love being at the center of them. So, you know, for now, I don't have a lot of like um, theory or like. Uh, uh, or associate. Yeah, there's no language yet in my universe. All black. It's a little bit. All black people are connected to a power source called this. Tapping this, that is ancestry is. It's like people pass on that transition into that this grave collective hive mind energy. Communicate with that and use it to alter, you know, your social or, or, or not, not even your social, but your like physical. And I'm that it's all like a metaphor for and tap into it. It can do when you just are content with that, when you, when you do understand that you're enough, you know what I'm saying? So it's. You know, yeah. Uh, that what I want to say is the abyss that hole that things come out of sometimes in your work. Yeah. Definitely, it's like yeah. Uh, uh all attention. Yeah. I was talking in my, I think now that I think about it, I was talking about the abyss. Oh, Cause my wife, I'm a decent cook. I'm not a great cook, but I'm pretty good at cooking like black people food. And, and my wife was asking me, I never measure anything. I sometimes have a recipe, sometimes don't. But cooking to me, especially, okay, something simple like beef patties and gravy something like making gravy, I never really knew how to do, but it's just kind of one of those things where I'm just like, I think I'm supposed to do this. And then I, I think I'm supposed to do that. And then bam, it ended up being gravy. So it was kind of like, and I was telling Kim, I was like, you know, I don't really measure this stuff. I don't really know how to cook necessarily, but I feel like when it comes to using a pressure cooker and putting greens in there, that's beyond me. Like, I don't have to know how to do that. I feel like it's been so many people behind me have done it that I like automatically know how to do it in some way. Maybe that's not the abyss, but I guess I kind of think of that connection to the ancestors that you spoke of. I think I feel that the most when I'm making our food without directions mm. or measuring cups. Um, Tim, I want to get you out of here. One final question. I want to look at one more painting and I kind of just want you to give us maybe the idea behind it and a little bit of the process and then we'll wrap up. Mm -hmm. So this is another painting of yours that I really like. And I wanted just to hear like what you have to say about it. Like, what are the different things being shown here? Uh, 
Sorry, I can't hardly hear you. I wanted to know if you could give us a few words about this painting. And like maybe <laughs> some of the themes or just like what's happening. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Here, I'm gonna type okay. in the chat. Um, and I just talk, I can talk about this one. Yeah, yeah. You can still hear me? Yes. It's going in and out a little bit. I hear like your chair creaking, but not hearing any words. Here, let's give it a quick refresh and see if that changes our look. I saw I can. Hello? Okay, I'm hearing you. Yeah, I, I can hear you. Okay. So yeah, any words on this? All right. Um, that one. That I painted that a couple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I painted that one a couple years ago. Um, I want to say that one was called Monsters Blood. And at that point, I feel like I was just trying to find. I was still trying to find what I wanted to say as an artist, but I was just creating a lot of like, you know, you know, images that I saw in my mind and just made them to like canvas or like a surface. That's that that one is wood. Um, you know, in the the piece is supposed to be like me making it packed with this like this dark version of myself. So like if you can see. Like it's it's like a host of like just entities behind me. It's like you know, panel in my hand, and I have like a paintbrush. The monster is like reaching over my shoulder and like and oozing out like I guess blood, and I'm supposed to be like using the blood to like create like like the imagery or like you know just. In, in that painting and then it's like it's like magic where like the blood is like space and stuff at that point i want to say monster monsters but um, a beat that i heard and i really liked just what i was like as I heard that. So, I mean, a oh, real huge overarching theme meaning behind it, but I just wanted to show that, like, you know, there was a consciousness between what I wanted to make and, and how I, and, and, you know, coming out onto the camera. Yeah, I really like this one. It's so interesting. And I find myself like looking through each one of the figures behind you. There's like a lot of, there's there's several of them. And there's even some that like are less pictured at the bottom. And I think I like art where there's a lot to look at. And um, that'll be, that's mm. like a good quality to have. I guess if you're going to make murals because the scale is so large. 
Um, Tim, we've only got a couple minutes left on here, as you right, said, right, right. with the session timer. I want to say thank you for sitting down with us. I'll leave you with one final question, and I ask this to every guest on the show. What music are you listening to? Mm -hmm. Well, say this. What music are you listening to these days? <laughs> um, man, a lot of stuff, man. Um, I made a play for this painting, this paintings. I listen to it occasionally when I just need to, like, uh, but um, it's like there's a popular, she's not really that popular, but um. She's like a soul artist. So, you like Neo Neo Soul? Um, her, mm -hmm. um, her With two album, H's? Um, for every girl, I think. For every. I think I know that singer. Kia. With two H's? Wait. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Kia, I'm gonna look that look into that. Okay, I know I, I was kind of visualizing the word and it's two A's. Okay, Kia. So maybe you might have just broken her. Now she's not gonna be underground anymore. Once she's been on the Michael Skiller show, you know, she's gonna be famous now. <laughs> so Kia owes you. And uh, just like that, there was one. Luckily, that came just as the time as we were wrapping up. So for all of our viewers, thank you for tuning in to another session of Common Time One-on-One, -on -one, where we like to sit down and speak at length with the artists, musicians, actors, directors, dancers, educators, people involved in and tangent to the arts, doing the work in all of our favorite fields, um, and just to pick their brain about what's going on in their life and what's going on in their art. Once again, thank you to Tim Short for sitting down with us. Please reach out to us at info at commentime.online. Follow us on socials at Common Time Online on Facebook and commentime.online on Instagram and LinkedIn. For you educators and artists out there, we've got two Facebook groups that are highly engaging. One is called Common Time for Artists, and the other one is Common Time for Educators. Thank you for um, tuning. That's what I'm looking for. Thank you for tuning in to Common Time One-on-One. -on -one. This is Michael Skillen, the Education Outreach Coordinator, and I bid you adieu.